I know, we're all dying to talk about the same thing. We're gonna get there. Don't worry. For the love of God, stick around for Citation Observations this week because I put a lot of work into it. Big up to Chris who's had to turn all of this into a video with very little time to do it. So thank you very much, Chris. Everyone, let's listen to the voice. Let's get going. This is it. It is the penultimate episode of Picard's final season, and it is called Vox, the Latin for voice. Let me go straight away with an up this week, and it's going to be for Ed Spilliers. As last week came to a close and you had Jack and Troy standing in front of the red door, we were talking behind the scenes and there was this legitimate worry that Troy was about to get culbered. You know, and that didn't go away with the fear of the opening to this episode, that Troy was going to discover what was behind that red door, and then suddenly Jack was going to go full Ash Tyler and just... We have been worried. Terry Metalis has been saying all the way through, don't expect everyone to be safe this season. So I was quite delighted that Troy didn't get culbered when she did discover what was behind the red door. The whole scene was played very, very well. The whole development of Jack's powers all the way along. I've actually been quite enjoying, but I'll come back to that one now in a moment. They stand in front of the red door, they talk about the symbolism of the vines of the door, Deanna reaches forward, opens it, and boom! I, I have to go now! And pegs it out of the room. Jack, a little bit worried because <laughs> what made the nice counsellor woman so terrified she had to leave a session? Understandable, it would throw you a little bit. Throughout this entire scene and the following ones, Ed Spilliers nails this performance of a man who is terrified, confused, quite rightly indignant about the injustices that have been done to him. Because with the revelations that follow, Jack is very much a victim in all of this. Troy runs down to sickbay and we're not left waiting. What is behind the red door? It's the Borg. That revelation as the door opens of a Borg cube sitting amongst a nebula or clouds is... I remember watching it and I was like, my initial reaction was... Okay, we're doing the Borg again. That was, that was my initial reaction, okay? Star Trek Picard seasons 1, 2 and 3 have used the Borg quite a bit. We had the Artifact and the XBs in season 1. We had Jurati and, you know, uh, Annie Wershing's Queen in season 2. So, you, you worry going into this final two is just like... Well, we keep beating the Borg, so what's the threat here? As the episode goes on, they deliver. So no, 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 there's, there, there, there's no doubt. Chris makes an excellent point that if perhaps episode one of the season pulled, uh, uh, he described it as pulled a Game of Thrones, opening scene, you get your White Walkers, and then you know the threat while, the, while your protagonists don't. And then we would have watched Jack's unraveling and development of his powers throughout the season that has been framed in a somewhat positive way you know, he's able to certainly help Sydney escape from the changelings. You know, that was great. But we would have known as an audience, like, he's he's getting Borgier. There's some Borg stuff coming on here. And I think I think that's, you know, that's that's a fair fair way of looking at it. Um I am personally okay with it being the Borg. More than okay, like I I like what they do with it. I think I I will say, I will understand if anyone had that momentary <sighs> the Borg. There is a fantastic exchange where Crusher and Picard had to deal with the fact that they as parents now have a child who has, through no fault of their own, this internal condition. But of course it hits Picard so much harder. He blames himself straight away. He says, this is, this is because of me. Now we know that that's not true. It's, you know, he is as much a victim as anyone, but if trauma followed logic, none of us would ever need therapy. He takes it upon himself to go and have this conversation with Jack. And their exchange is, it's sweet, it's infuriating that they have to have this conversation. Jack's reaction, completely understandable. Jean-Luc is, is feeling self-pity, but is also feeling hatred, and you can feel that coming out. 
you know, what the Borg made him do, what she, and we all know who she is, made him do and can make anyone do. Now we get to the bit where there is the revelation that Jack has got to be put under security. We know he can take control of people. And if we now know the Borg are channeling that, he can't be allowed to roam free. Jack does not take this well. And I think, would any of us? Unfortunately, Jack can do something about it. So, you know, the two guards who are there to keep him locked in quickly become extensions of Jack himself. Now, he doesn't, you know, yes, they point their weapons at Jean-Luc, but did anyone really think they were ever going to fire? All Jack is doing, he's just, he's leaving. He is now taking it upon himself to go and deal with the Borg. He can hear them. There was a fantastic scene, fantastic, where Beverly runs after him and she begs him to stay, that they will work on it together. And he is so full of hatred and anger at this point, not toward her, but toward the Borg, that he's just not having it. Up for Ed Spilliers, up for Gates McFadden, up for Patrick Stewart. There was, yeah, there, there, there's, a, there's a bit of that that we'll have to come back to now in a few minutes. As Jack warps away, we see Crusher and Picard in the observation lounge and Crusher delivers a heartbreaking sentence. I gave Wesley space and I lost him to it. So I watched Jack even more closely. That's up. Because not only the fact that we get Wesley mentioned here as well, but as far as we know, yes, we as an audience, we saw Wesley last season. We know he's doing okay. But it seems that Crusher doesn't know that, that he doesn't drop in for food from time to time. Mm, frankly, dick move, Wesley. But also, there is this pain of being a mother who's lost a child and is then in, you know, she's done everything in terms of keeping her second child safe and has just possibly lost her second one. It's heartbreaking. But being Dr. Crusher, she says, you know, this is a complete and utter mess and everything, so I'm going to go and do something about it. She leaves. Jean-Luc is feeling it. He, you know, sits down and, you know, head in hands and, and Data walks in and tells him, look, we've had no luck finding Jack. I goes, would you like me to say something comforting? And Picard says, I think you'll find that impossible. And Data just places his hand on Picard's shoulder up. It's so beautifully done because if you think anyone with the relationship to Jean-Luc, you know, Crusher could have done that, Riker could have done that, but it hits so much harder that it's Data who does that. And that was a beautiful gesture. Now, we don't get to sit around too long. We get called down to sickbay and we discover that the part of the parietal lobe that was taken from Captain Picard's body is actually, it's a little bit of DNA code that has been wound in to the transporter systems. And we're going, what? What's that got to do? That's a bit weird. Is it some way of identifying, if not like-minded, like like-bodied people? You know, at this point, we don't know what this DNA code extraction is about, why it was so important to the changelings, why it now potentially is so important to the Borg. What we do know is that it is in the transporter architecture, which means it's throughout the fleet which means we've got to go to the fleet. As I say, stick around for cetacean observations. You'll have a good time. We do a fantastic zoom in shot. There is a master systems display of the of space dock and all the ships around it. And we zoom in and we see a lot of these ships. They are lined up behind space dock and we get the voiceover, which says NCC 1701 F is ready for departure. Will you take an up? We finally get the Odyssey class Enterprise F. That the wonderful Adam Eel, who originally designed the Enterprise F. We finally get to see her on screen. And you know what? It was a bit cool. Adam Eel, amazing design. And Thomas Moroni rebuilding it for the show from Star Trek Online. And we think this is just bloody gorgeous. Doors of space dock open, it emerges, it is a big massive triumphant moment. We get that huge sexy shot of its underside. I mean, it's just, it's just, how does it get much better than this? Sorry, who's commanding the Enterprise F? It's only flipping five star Admiral Shelby. 
Okay, I'm gonna say this. I did not see this cameo coming. Uh, and it's hilarious because think when she was introduced, best of both worlds. You know, she has basically got as much of a relationship with the Borg nearly as the crew of the Enterprise D do. And to have her commanding the Enterprise F during this moment is just a wonderful callback, but also it's just great to see Elizabeth Dennehy again. Um, this was this was this was a great surprise. Five Star Admiral keeping well on track with her fast tracking through Starfleet. She was a lieutenant commander at best of both worlds. And now she outranks both Picard and Janeway. Not bad. Not bad, Shelby. We get a great speech that commemorates the 250th anniversary of the launch of the NX-01. Take yourself an up there. That ship will always get an up from me. And it is supposed to be this beautiful, triumphant moment. Deadly, right? What could go wrong? Jack arrives at some sort of cloud-based thing. And he's like, no, 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 can't see anything, can't see anything. What's going on? And, oh dear. Oh dearie, dearie me. That's a rather large Borg ship in front of him, isn't it? He steps on board the Borg ship and a very, very familiar voice rings through the hallways of this ship. My friends, getting it up this week is the return of Alice Krieg as the Borg Queen. <laughs> yes. Now that raises questions. Which queen is this? You know, I suppose spiritually it probably is the same queen who was in Best of Both Worlds, body was destroyed, appeared in First Contact. You know, you think in such three-dimensional terms. You know, so could this physically be the queen from Endgame? Yes, we saw lots of explosions, but again, I refer you back to Best of Both Worlds. Just hearing Krieg's voice again is Spine chilling. I mean, she really is just incredible orator. You have Jack who is valiantly trying, I mean, he is there to kill her. That's, that is why he is there. And it is brave, but ultimately he is rapidly overpowered. Now, we were talking behind the scenes, myself and Chris, and we thought, damn, have they just done this, you know, trope of, you know, hero tries to save the day, ends up becoming villain because he is very quickly he gets a, a tube in the neck. And then we went, oh God, Deanna, what have you done? He was always going to find this out. This was the entire point of him being hunted for the season. Vadik was going to take him to the queen. Deanna merely accidentally got to that revelation. He would have got there anyway. I mean, we might comment on the timing of it, but really, no, like this would have happened sooner if Fadig had had her way. So actually it it all fits into place very, very nicely. You do feel bad for Jack. I mean, of course you feel bad for Jack, but you feel bad because you see his earnestness. He doesn't give in. There's a switch inside him. And it's, it's heartbreaking because much like Locutus before him, he doesn't have any say. There is, of course, a great delivery of resistance is futile. Does anyone not get that feeling when you hear that, particularly when Alice Krieg says it? I just want to take a, a quick a quick moment just to pause here and say, um, while I am delighted, delighted to hear Alice Krieg back in the role and straight away I'm locked into First Contact, Best of Both Worlds, um, my heart is a little bit sore for how much I had come to love Annie Wershing's Borg Queen last season. I had hoped perhaps we might see Annie again, um, and this seems to not be the case, but I think she left such a wonderful mark on the franchise that she will not be forgotten. I am not in any way sad to have Alice Greig back as the Queen, not by any means. Um, I just think it's a testament to how good Annie Wershing was. Back aboard the Titan, as we're warping toward Frontier Day, we get this explanation that the Borg left something additional inside Jean-Luc, something organic, something, you know, so small that 35 years ago when he was rescued from the Collective, yeah, they couldn't detect it. This is what would become what they thought was Eremotic Syndrome and ended up becoming this, as they called it, a seed that the Borg left inside. Now, this did kill him, but through him, it passed into Jack and they are then able to manipulate that. That makes me a little bit worried for Janeway, Torres and Tuvok then, doesn't it? 
and Seven. You know, but of all of them, we know Taurus had a child post-assimilation. Miral. I... I sure hope she's okay. As Jack is plugged in, just effectively as the Titan arrives, you know, Picard quickly sends out a fleet-wide message going, I need everyone to listen to me. This is vital importance. The Borg are back. And, sorry, taken up. Shelby does contact the Titan to go, okay, hang on. Well, listen at least. And that was, that wasn't up because, you know, Starfleet doesn't just go, ah, shut up. So that was, that, that was great. Unfortunately, yeah, it doesn't really come to much because now we find out what that DNA code in the transporter architecture was about. And when I tell you, this was unsettling. Every single person who's been through a transporter in the previous amount of time has been fitted with this code. As I say, the computer stores common code to species uh, to sort of effectively make a bit of a shortcut when reassembling people, which itself is possibly terrifying, but still. And it means that, at least in humans, everyone up to the age of 25, which is when the parietal lobe uh, finishes development, they were fitted with this DNA. Well, everyone has it, but particularly them. That's like a backdoor code for the Borg to gain entry. This is terrifying. Ensign Muro. Sidney LaForge, Ensign Esmar, all of them start becoming Borg. They got behind the walls. There's no full frontal assault, because full frontal assaults don't work with the Borg. They, they have tried to take on Starfleet several times and it never works. They seem to have nailed it. By weaponizing Jean-Luc's DNA and using Jack as a transmitter, Everyone that they were able to contaminate with this DNA under the age of 25 is now theirs. So this new method of assimilation for me is definitely an up. I thought that is a really interesting way of doing that. Um, I thought that was that was so unsettling. Now, now you're, you're wondering why I'm looking over here. Fleet automation. Gathering the fleet in one place, fleet automation. Now, I've downed that already this season, but there's a reason I'm downing it again here, right? So, locking all the ships in together, one unified mind. Now, we do hang a lampshade on it. You know, Picard and Riker effectively speak on the irony of Shelby, you know, promo promoting something that is so Borg-like. But So, we, we do address that. But this is, this is toward Star Trek as a franchise, okay? I want to be very, very fair because these scripts were written a long time ago. Okay, so this is, I know you're going to look at this as like, I'm downing this episode. No, I'm actually downing Star Trek the franchise at the moment. I know, I've just lost my job. We're going to take over all the ships by, you know, a, a, a giant uh, assimilation thing. We're going to li link them all in together and then they're all going to, you know, turn on themselves. Supernova parts one and two in Prodigy and of course the Texas class ships in Lower Decks. These are both same but different situations. The living construct in Prodigy does to the ships what the Borg DNA is doing to the people. And now the Texas class themselves speaks to this, you know, automation um, and the attacking, particularly attacking space dock as the fleet is set up to do at the end of this episode. This is, and I, 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 I say this with complete respect, this comes across like no one is talking to each other at Paramount. Um, because if after the debacle with the Texas class, you might go, right, okay, well, we're going to avoid any kind of automation. And actually, I, I, I am forgiving of that one. I'm, I, this is evocative of that one, but I'm forgiving of it. But after the living construct, this one feels like, would we really automate the entire fleet? If it could be, if it could be co-opted like this. So unfortunately, I have to say that for this week, my trellium down goes to the perceived lack of communication across the board. I am I am just a viewer. I am just a viewer. I do not know what goes on behind closed doors. I don't want to suggest that I know what goes on behind closed doors. Just as a viewer, watching these things relatively close together, you're like, oh, but we've seen this. But because we've seen this, and Prodigy, of course, is set roughly 20 years before this, you're going... Uh, but would they not have learned from that? And if, let's say, for example, let's flip it around, let's say this was written long before Prodigy was, uh, you're like, oh, okay, well, so it, it's kind of like, oh, so by watching all of the shows, it raises this question. 
Um, so that is my, my, my trillium down. But also, and I really want to make this point again, that's not me saying this episode is bad. Another thought, actually, this down stems back to the uniforms inconsistency, particularly around the 2380s. And you know, we love uniforms. Just, just talk about it. Just sit down at a table and be nerds. LeVar Burton, when he hears his girls being assimilated, just ouch in my heart. Uh, we also have Data and Geordie together. Data's going like, you know, we need a plan, we need a plan. That's an up, that is brilliant. Seven, Shaw, Riker and Picard. They get into the turbulence, they manage to get off the bridge. You know, they have phasers set to stun. They know it's not their crew's fault that they're turning into Borg. Um, I have to address, of course, the fact that Shelby, who we haven't seen since Best of Both Worlds, takes two phaser blasts in either shoulder. Now, I didn't see a death certificate. Did you? Yeah, it doesn't look very good for her. But as the turbo lift stops at one of the floors, we see the doors open and now he's Borgified. But one of the, uh, you know, the gold shirts, if you like, comes walking toward him and he's got that same phaser burn right there. So until I see a headstone with Shelby's name on it, she's alive. It's tenuous, but I'm taking it. I will say, obviously, things don't look good for Shelby. She gets shot there and she gets shot there. So on the one hand, I do want to make a point of saying we don't see a death certificate. But on the other hand, has there ever been a more fitting time to say, press F to pay respects? Eh? 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 Yeah, because she's on the Enterprise F? Yeah. Shaw, Picard, Riker and Seven all escape down the turbo lift and through the unlucky... Uh, thing that happens to the Excelsior, they, Shaw re remembers, hang on, there's a maintenance deck, no one goes down there. Let's head down there, that's the perfect way to get out of there. And Picard immediately, he, now we have to assume private comms, the, you know, the rest of the crew, and says, right, everyone get down there as quick as possible. And you know, there's kind of, you can see almost a, a, you know, we can make our escape from there. You can almost see a moment on uh, Shaw's face of like, I literally just said that. They get there and, excellent. All of, our, all of our peeps are waiting there. We got Raffi, Troy, Data, Geordi, and Worf. Brilliant! So naturally, of course, some Borgified people turn up. They start firing. There's a shuttle there. Grand, 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 grand. You know where I'm going with this. Who called episode nine? Hmm? Shaw bites the big one. Can I just give a whopper of an up to Todd Stashwick this season? We went from... This person is the worst person ever in Star Trek 2. If Shaw dies, we riot. Over these nine episodes, we have seen why he is the way that he is. We've seen his arc, and particularly his arc with Seven. So that when he is shot, helping this crew to escape, in the words of Todd himself, he knights Seven. He says, you have the con, Seven of Nine. It's a... You know, it's a quick moment, it's a beautiful moment, and it works. I think Shaw is going to be one of the all-time Trek characters. You know, I think, I honestly think that. I think Todd Stashwick does such a good job with this character. You know, we go from the most memeable no that was ever stated to someone who I will genuinely miss in Star Trek going forward. So, Shaw, we miss you, but thanks for the journey. The fleet has taken over, they begin, you know, they're locked onto space dock. Things are not looking particularly good. Shuttle flips over to the Fleet Museum. We're all just a little bit happy there. We're all going to be really positive about everything. Even Data's positive. I hope we die quickly. Taken up. Geordi says, you know, well, we need a ship that's not connected to the mainframe. And we're thinking, oh my God, Enterprise A, Defiant, Voyager, any of these? And he says, nah, y'all remember I mentioned something about Hangar 12 earlier in the season? 
My friends, this season now has a dilithium up. NCC 1701D. Who didn't feel something watching this scene? Who didn't feel it right there where the heart should be? I, I'm seeing a doctor about it. For a season that has been plagued with leaks and people sharing spoilers and screenshots, this one thankfully surprised me. The shuttle flies in, we get a gorgeous panning shot, we get the explanation as to how it came back and it makes perfect sense. Prime Directive, take the, sh take the saucer section up off Viridian 3. Geordi explains that the drive section and the nacelle covers come from the USS Syracuse. Great. There is a brilliant moment. Obviously, we can't use the Enterprise E and everyone turns to look at Worf who goes, that was not my fault. That's an up. Nice to, nice to see the Enterprise E is getting a shout out. We know something has happened that's taken the E out of commission. Um, but for me and for Chris, that's our latinum up of the episode because that confirms that it's Captain Worf of the Enterprise E to us. And I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Now, I'm still reveling in this dilithium up that is the Enterprise D. I mean, we step onto the bridge of the Enterprise D. I mean, seriously. I mean, seriously. We are walking around this amazingly stunning set. And it's similar to, the, you know, for the lighting to, you know, the arc of the roll bar over security. You know, to the gags, everything. Just, you know, to Data going, hello, chair. I got really emotional watching this. Um, it's beautiful. There is a fantastic joke. Picard goes, you know, until I was here with all of you, I didn't realize the one thing I really missed was the carpet taken up. Wow, this is, this can't get better. I do have a tiny little down. It's not to do with the Enterprise D at all. Like that's just uh, reveling in that. There is a scene where, you know, Picard says, I can't ask any of you to come with me. And Riker says, we are your family. Jack, Sydney, and Alandra are a family as well. Has anyone checked on Kestra? According to an interview, uh, it, you know, it's been suggested by the showrunners that Kestra is on Earth at Starfleet Academy. I think it's too much to hope that it's only the starships that have been affected by this transporter code, which means there is zero chance that Kestra hasn't gone through a transporter at Starfleet Academy. We've seen it in seasons one and two that there's these walk-in transporters the whole time. Kestra is definitely a Borg right now, like definitely. And further to that, there's clearly some sort of Borg zombie apocalypse happening on Earth. Be nice to check in with her or show some sort of concern for your daughter. Considering we really, really care about Sydney and Alandra, and rightly so, and Jack, rightly so, because they're on screen. Still reveling in the dilithium up. Another up that I didn't think we were going to get. Picard says, you know, all right, computer, uh, I would like to assume command. The first lady of Star Trek herself, Majel Barrett, makes a cameo posthumously as the voice of the Enterprise D computer. And if that didn't make that tear that was threatening to come down your face, come down your face. Well, we need to have a conversation. They pilot the ship out of space dock and it warps away and the episode ends. And oh, just oh. Now, let's go to cetacean observations because I think we've all been waiting for this one. Now, the song we hear in the beginning in Jack's uh, vision is I Just I Can't Stop Crying by Will White, a favour of his mum. He talks about the Crimson Arboretum, which is a reference to the Red Forest of Twelve Monkeys, on Raritan 4, which was the planet that we saw Soji and Dr. Jurati on in Season 2, Episode 1, where the Deltons are hanging out, named after Raritan near New Jersey. We hear the voice of Locutus of Borg as Picard realises what's happening to Jack. Now, Crusher says, we haven't heard from the Borg in over a decade. Um, that, that stopped me in my tracks because I went, well, hang on, right? Let's do, the, let's do the dates here. This is 2401. So over a decade suggests that the 2380s is the last time we hear from the Borg. And I'm, I'm, I, I'm going to give this a down, but bear with me. Um, this could be an allusion to the fact uh, you know, that episode of Star Trek Prodigy, Let Sleeping Borg Lie. But is, is that also suggesting that the artifact and the XBs don't count in season one or that the Borg Queen and Jurati don't count in season two? I, 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 I just, for me, that was, it was enough to go, hang on. Like, they were Borg. 
they were in the previous two seasons. The TNG door chime is heard uh, as Picard is entering Jack's quarters. They talk about Kestlevar on Vulcan, where they can mind meld the Borg out of him. He says Picard resisting would be futility. There is a reference, of course, to Wesley Crusher. They talk about a transwarp corridor in this nebula gas, and we hear that noise from first contact of the Borg speaking to Jack in his head. And then we get the ship schematic. Are you sitting comfortably? We see the USS Okuda, of course, named for Mike and Denise Okuda. We have the USS Sutherland. Now we have a bunch that are named after moons. We have the Ganymede, the Callisto, the Amalthea, the Himalaya. They are all moons of Jupiter. I'm going to take it, go on a limb and say they're all Luna class ships. With the USS Venture, which is probably a Ross class ship, but probably getting its name from the Galaxy class that did so well in Deep Space Nine. The USS Drexler. Now, first of all, the Okuda taken up, the Drexler taken up. Doug Drexler their designer of so many ships, including the NX-01. The USS Akira, the USS Thunderchild, nice to see it survived its encounter with the living construct. The USS Resnick, taken up for that, named for Judith Resnick, who unfortunately died on the Challenger explosion in 1986. She was the second woman ever to fly into space. The USS Mandel, named after Jeffrey Mandel, member of the art department. Of course, we see the Excelsior, we see the Clark, we see the Ross, we see the Appalachia from First Contact. The USS Tarango, named after Sean Tarango, designer of the Luna-class USS Titan. The USS Gagarin, the USS Oberon, another moon, so I'm guessing another Luna-class ship. The USS Gilgamesh, the USS Luna. USS Reliant, the USS Tiro, named after the Roman Tiro, who is credited with the invention of Tyronian notes, which is a system of shorthand for you writers out there, by the way support the Writers Guild strike. The USS Harlan, which I presume is named for Harlan Ellison, who, who was the original writer for The City on the Edge of Forever. That's a fascinating story. The USS John Kelly, who I'm making an assumption here, but I believe this one is named after a professor of chemical engineering who was a dean at University College Dublin, which is my alma mater. The USS Forrest, which I'm assuming is for Admiral Forrest, the USS Zheng He, the USS Helios, the USS Shackleton, the USS Ibn al-Haytham, who is credited as the father of modern optics. He was from the Islamic Golden Age. The USS Huygens, which I hope I pronounced that correctly, who was a Dutch mathematician. The USS Cabot, the USS Christopher, the USS Pasha Kuti, who was the ninth Sapa Inca of the Kingdom of Cusco, which he transformed into the Inca Empire. And it's widely believed that his estate was Machu Picchu. The USS Rabin, the USS Fire Sword, the USS Almagest, which was a treatise on mathematicians, the USS Trumbull, taken up there, Douglas Trumbull, who was, of course, part of the team who put together that amazing tracking shot for Star Trek The Motion Picture, the USS Galatea, which is a moon of Neptune, the USS Cochrane, the USS Hikaru Sulu, taken up, the USS Intrepid, and, of course, taken up USS Pulaski. Hold up, hold up, hold up. We were nearly done. We thought we were nearly done. But the wonderful Mike Overton has discovered more ships. Mike Overton and Starbase 400, thank you very much for the USS Cole, the USS Mestral, who of course we remember from Carbon Creek, the USS Nathan Hale, the USS Sternbach, the Echelon class we saw earlier on in the season, named for Rick Sternbach, the USS Hrothgar, the USS Eureka, the USS Yi Sun Sun, the USS Arsino, the USS Uhura, taken up, the USS Europa, the USS Valkyrie, the USS Rushdash, the USS Vanguard, and the USS Avalon. We're never going to get to sleep tonight, are we? Shall we look at the classes of ships that were seen in that fleet shop? So I'm going on as clear as pictures as I can get here. So if I've missed any, just keep an eye out over the coming days for high res shots shared by some of our good friends on Twitter. <coughs> Jorg. <coughs> there is Defiant class, Sovereign class, Inquiry class, Ross class, Pathfinder class, Echelon class, Sagan class, Odyssey class, Excelsior 2 class, Sutherland class, Reliant class, and the Alita class, which is another Star Trek Online ship, which I believe makes its debut here. Uh, gorgeous looking ship, seems to be inspired by the Akira class. Okay, let's take a breath, everyone. Let's take a breath. There is, of course, the immediate reaction that Riker gets upon seeing Shelby. Uh, I just love that because, of course, they were not fans of each other, um, which I really liked that. Now, when we get to the Fleet Museum, um, although 
I, I can't be sure. I think that the the Akira class that we see is the Thunder Child. I just want to shout out the fact that after the bounty was released, there was a rename of another Akira class ship at the Fleet Museum to the USS Wershing. So I just want to give that a shout out there as well. We, of course, see our original Constitution class, the New Jersey. We see the Enterprise A. We see Voyager. We see the Refit NX-01. We see the Stargazer. We see the Nebula class, the Defiant, the Romulan Bird of Prey, the Enterprise D. Uh, the reference to, of course, the saucer section being collected from Viridian 3. The reference to the Enterprise E, of course. We hear the Alexander Courage theme playing over the reveal of the Enterprise D. We hear a statement from the Generations theme by Dennis McCarthy as they step onto the bridge. We, of course, hear Jerry Goldsmith's great Next Generation theme over the motion picture as well. Now we get a beautiful shot of the plaque of the Enterprise D. We get Majel Barrett, of course. Uh, the crew are more or less in their season one positions as the ship is piloted out of space dock. As the D exits ha hangar 12, we see the NX-01 just above it. Lovely to see those two ships in the same shot. Picard says, engage, and we hear the TNG warp effect. <laughs> My friends, I hope that you enjoyed this breakdown. There is, I mean, there's so much going on in this, it would be shocking if I didn't miss something. So let me know. Whatever time you're watching this ass, please, please be cool. Please be sound. Don't go straight away to social media and post all spoilers. Uh, we are going to be very, very careful, of course, in what we post. You will have seen the thumbnail that we've used for this video is something that has appeared in several trailers. So we've gone with what's safe there. Uh, please, guys, let's let's all share this information or we we'll share this excitement together. Uh, you're all awesome. You're all wonderful. Thank you for sticking with us for this extended runtime. You're brilliant and beautiful. Thank you so much, Chris, for making this take shape. Uh, I know you and I know enough to know that you haven't slept. Everyone with one episode left to go. Do you reckon they can stick the landing? Let's find out next week. You guys are all awesome. Make sure you live long and prosper till I see you again. Lead with love. Lead with kindness. Be just, be good people to everyone around you. Um, just, just be cool. Just be cool. Everyone, look after yourselves until I see you again. Make it so.